Hey everyone, happy Sunday. I hope you've had a great week and are ready for a great morning together as we continue in Genesis and spend our time opening God's word, praying, giving, singing, and all around worshiping God for what he's done, but even more for who he is. God is worthy of worship, and we get to come in here today to collectively offer the worship he's deserving of. I'm glad you're a part of it. If you're with us for the first time today, I first want to say welcome and let you know that this is a beautiful place you found yourself. Second, there's a link there in the chat for our Connect card. I'd love for you to take a second to fill that out to learn more about who we are and how you might take your next best step. You'll hear more about that in just a second. So let's head over and then I will see you all in just a bit. Well, good morning, Christ Chapel. Thank you. My name is Brooke, and it's such a privilege to get to worship with you this morning and to welcome you to worship. Um, I'm so glad that you're here. If you were a guest with us, and maybe this is your first time with us, or you are still looking to get more plugged in and to take next steps at Christ Chapel, um, we want to help you do that. We deeply care about making sure that that happens and happens well. And you can help us by filling out this. You'll see this in the seat back in front of you. This is called a Connect card. And if you take this and fill it out and drop it in the offering box outside of this room when you leave today, um, we will reach out to you this week with more information and next steps. You'll also see in the seat back in front of you a card that looks like this. This is our prayer card. We are a church that believes deeply in the power of prayer. Um, we believe that God cares about what we care about because he cares for us and about us. And so we want to be a church family that prays with and for you and one another. And so we would love to partner with you in prayer. So um, if there's something that we can lift up alongside you and on your behalf this week, you can put that on the card and, again, drop it in the offering box as well. And if you're online, there's a link to both of those cards in the chat. Um, well, church, 2024 is off to a good and cold start, um, and it's that time of year where a lot of groups um, are kicking off and different offerings at Christ Chapel, um, and one of um, something near and dear to my heart is our soul care ministry. Um, that is a ministry meant to help you minister to and care for your soul and your well-being. Um, we believe that the gospel is the foundation for redemption and restoration, regardless of what you're walking in or through, and we want to be a church that helps meet you where you're at in that um, and so if that piques your interest or um, you have more questions or are interested in that, you can use the link um, to the website to find all of that information about when those start and what all is offered. Um, church, we love you. We're glad you're here. I'm so excited to worship with you this morning. So let's begin our time together by standing and greeting those around us. Sing together. I sing the Almighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the Oh, 
Let's sing together about his love for us, his care before the throne. Before the throne. It just makes me want to continue to praise God from whom all blessings flow. And we're going to sing that in just a minute. Uh, but to this tune, we also have some new words to sing today that you'll be uh, not familiar with, but you're familiar with the tune. And these words are uh, right on topic with our message today as we are made in the image of God. This hymn is called, O Lord, You Formed Man in Your Image. And it's to the tune of doxology. And we'll finish by singing the doxology together. You ready? Here we go. Let's sing together. Oh Lord, you form man from the earth. And Oh, man. 
praise together by singing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Amen that we have a God who has stamped his image on us that has created such worth. We're going to continue to worship. Uh, we're going to continue to worship through our giving church. Uh, our giving is, is just that. Uh, our worship is singing, um, but it's also how we serve. It's how we give. It's how we use our gifts. So if that's something that uh, aligns with where your heart is at, again, not out of guilt do we give, not out of thinking we're purchasing something from God, but if your heart aligns uh, with the spirit of generosity where you want to give unto the Lord, there's always three ways you can do that here at Christ Chapel. You can give uh, by texting the number on the screen. You can give online, or if you brought a gift, you can drop it in the offering on your way out. Um, today is a special day. Today is the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's a day that we, we celebrate here at this church. We take seriously here at this church, but we also don't need uh, one Sunday out of the year uh, to remind us what we know to be true every single Sunday and every single uh, day of the week that God values life from conception all the way until the last breath we breathe. Um, that is what we see God in Scripture tell us. It's what we'll talk about today. You'll hear in the sermon that Cody will preach in Genesis that being image bearers of God, that God has stamped from conception when he knit us together in the womb, stamped us with this stamp that says, this is the bearer of my image all the way until our death, and that is where our value and our worth belong. That's where our dignity comes from. Uh, and that means that as the church, we can never grow weary we can never stop advocating and standing in the gap uh, for, for life. Uh, we can never stop standing in the gap for, for life uh, for the unborn child, church. We, we cannot stop advocating and we will not stop advocating for uh, life for the woman who's in, in a crisis pregnancy center somewhere in our city to advocate for those who are in the foster care system, for those who are survivors of trafficking, um, we can't stop standing in the gap for those who have had abortions. And as the church, standing in the gap to advocate and wrap the arms of Jesus around those who are carrying the hurt and the pain and, and the consequences of that and show them the grace of Jesus, standing in the gap uh, for those who are struggling to conceive and wrestling with infant loss and special needs and, and the elderly and so many things. And, and Jesus is for them. And so we as his people are for them also. Our for life ministry, Christ Chapel here, um, is, does all of those things. All of those things I just mentioned, there's an aspect within our for life ministry that is stepping into one of those areas and, and ministering as the hands and feet of Christ uh, to one of those pockets uh, in our city. We're hosting a lunch right after uh, this service. If you'd like to hear more about it, if you'd like to figure out how you could be involved in one of those aspects, of our four life um, initiatives and our four life ministry. Just head over to the Oak Room after this service and hear about it. Uh, you'll be amazed at what God is doing. Uh, free lunch also, if that's not enough, uh, just head on over to the Oak Room and join us for that. And, and if you don't have time for lunch, then go on our website and hear about all that this amazing ministry and that really God is doing and, and using uh, staff and volunteers here to do. Uh, we praise God for it. We're going to spend some time praying, and we're going to pray appropriately uh, and use Psalm 139 as kind of our guide this morning. Psalm 139 talks about this, this God and his intimate knowledge of us, so we'll approach him intimately. Would you bow your heads with me? Verses 1 and 2 in that chapter in Psalm says this. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Would you spend some time this morning beginning by just thanking God that he knows us, that he watches over us, that he cares for us. Verse 
verses 23 and 24 of the same chapter. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would you spend some time this morning confessing any grievous way that might be in you? What are the things that you put before the Lord? What are the things that you choose over him? Would you bring those confessions to a gracious king this morning? Verse 13 and 14, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We know every child is precious because they are created by God. So let's pray for our partners who are on the front lines protecting and preserving life. Would you pray for the pregnancy centers, the adoptive care ministries, the CASA volunteers, those who are pushing against the trafficking that happens in our world. Would you pray that God would sustain their efforts? Would you pray that that he would shine his light and that life would be cherished. Let's spend some time praying for those partners. Father, we love you and we're grateful for how you love us, how you've knit us together, Lord, how you have stamped on our life this image bearer of you, Lord, and, and where our dignity uh, comes from, God. Would we, uh, would we lean into that? Would we be image bearers that reflect that in a world uh, that, that needs it desperately? For your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Man, so glad to worship with you. Hello to all of you uh, joining us online. We're going to have uh, a good day today together. I'm really looking forward to it. I uh, also want to tell you this is a special Sunday because we are kicking off the 5 o'clock service at the Fort Worth campus. So really excited about that. And if you know of anybody who is looking for a church home or looking for a worship service and that fits their schedule, we really do hope that that is an, a great outreach uh, to folks in our city, especially the those folks that work on Sunday all throughout the day that they can come uh, after they get off of work, uh, you know, the hospital district, all those uh, vocations, certainly thankful for them and want to give that opportunity for them to be able to worship and be a part of a uh, church family. So excited about that. That's at five o'clock tonight. So spread the word. But we are getting into the time of year where the Super Bowl is coming upon us. And uh, you know what everybody looks forward to about the Super Bowl, right? Not the Cowboys, <laughs> the commercials. Everybody looks forward to the commercials. Now, some people look forward to the game, but everybody looks forward to the commercials. But I want to take you back uh, to a commercial that was way back in 1993. It was actually a pretty controversial commercial uh, at the time. It was a Nike commercial that was done with Charles Barkley. You guys know who Charles Barkley is, right? The, the basketball player, he played at Auburn, was drafted by Philadelphia, went to Phoenix, and then finished in Houston. I think, but uh, now he's a, a commentator. But uh, Charles Barkley did a commercial uh, back in 1993, and it was controversial mostly because of the, just the message, obviously. But the, the first line that Charles Barkley says in this commercial is, I am not a role model. He says, I am not a role model. He said, I don't get paid to be a role model. He goes on in the commercial, he says, I get paid to, to wreak havoc on the court. He said, parents are supposed to be role models. He said, just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should be a role model for your child. Now, there's a lot that I can agree with uh, on that point. Certainly agree that parents, you are the role model for your children. You're the main role model. That's why at Christ Chapel, we want to equip parents uh, to be the main disciplers in their child's life. We want to equip you. We want to encourage you, empower you, all of those wonderful things. We as a church are just supposed to, we want to supplement you and come alongside you. We can support you to do that, but you are, as a parent, your child's main uh, role model. But uh, when I was thinking about that commercial, uh, one of the reasons why it's controversial when he says, I am not a role model, is because I don't think he gets a choice. I mean, I, I, do you think that professional athletes get a choice whether they're a role model or not? I mean, honestly, it, don't, it, it really doesn't, doesn't matter uh, what they do. They, they are uh, creating, in a sense, just simply by their, their vocation and their platform, they are creating this, this image that children aspire to and imitate. It, it, it's just natural how that happens uh, back, way, way back when. Uh, our older son, Dax, uh, he was playing soccer, and he was probably about five years old, maybe six, uh, playing in a, a recreational league. I mean, this was not a serious or, or anything like that. Uh, but in this particular game, Dax scored a goal. And after he scored a goal, he runs back to the crowd, and he starts doing this. <laughs> And he's getting everybody fired up. And all the parents started laughing, and they turned to me, and they're like, did you teach him uh, to do that? And, and I'm like, when would he have seen me do this? I'm like, yeah, I celebrate sermons in, this, in the same way, you know? <laughs> I, I, I go home, and I slide in on my knees, you know, and I start shooting arrows, you know, into the heavenly host. No! He didn't learn it from me. Where did he learn it? He learned it watching television. Because that's what soccer players do on television. They get everybody fired up. You see, those athletes, those, those public figures in a sense, you don't get a choice. 
You're, you're creating an image that people uh, aspire to and, and imitate, whether you like it or not. Now, we can get onto our children about the ones that they choose to imitate or aspire to, but honestly, as adults, we do the same thing. We have images that we uh, aspire to, whether it's the image of uh, I know it all, whether it's the image of I have it all together, whether it's the image of I can do it all. Uh, we all have these images that we create in our mind that we uh, 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 aspire to or we work towards to, to, to live up to something else. But you all know that if you aspire to those things, you will always fall short because you weren't created to be in that image of a know-it-all, a do-it-all, a have-it-all together. You were created with a, a, a particular person's name. You were created in their image, and you were created to grow in their likeness. And that is God himself, because you are uniquely you, but you are also called to be uniquely his. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you will, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, just, we're just going to be in verses 26 and 27 today. That's page 1, if you're opening one of those blue Bibles underneath your seat. And would love for you to open the scriptures and obviously have the sermon notes. Some of the things that we're going to talk about are not going to come up on the screen, but also we'll be referring back to different things that we studied uh, throughout this series, even though it's been a short series. Uh, but we started with the beginning of God, uh, in the beginning God, and we talked about how in every beginning go back to God, and then last week we covered the seven days of creation, uh, but we're going to this week and next week, we're going to stop uh, in a sense for two weeks, and we're just going to focus on that sixth day of creation, and the reason why we're going to focus on that sixth day of creation is because on the sixth day of creation, he created human beings. He, cre he created us, and so we're going to stop and pause and take a moment to drill down into those specific intentions and purposes that God has uh, for humankind. So today we're going to stop on just those particular two verses where uh, God talks about creating uh, human beings. But another reason why we're going to stop there today is because today is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It's the one Sunday a year set aside uh, to talk about the value of life. And and at Christ Chapel, uh, we are pro-life. We always have been. We always will be. But please hear me say this. That is not a political statement. That is a biblical statement. Uh, that is a biblical statement where we get that value uh, from. Uh, remember, Jesus said in John chapter 10, I came to give you life. I came to give you life and life abundantly. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you may have life. And so that's why as a church, when we talk about the value of life and the way that we want to care for life from the preborn all the way to the saint that's about to see Jesus face to face, we talk about it as for life. Because we, we are for life in all of those aspects. That's why we support and have wonderful uh, partners in pregnancy centers. Many of you um, volunteer in these ways. I mean, we have quilting ministries. We have adoptive ministries. Uh, we have even held things where we've talked about end-of-life care. Uh, we span the gamut. We care about life because God cares about life. And that's why we're going to slow down and talk about that today. But especially if that's a, a new concept to you or uh, that is new to you hearing us say that as a church, I, I want you to know where we get that from. Why do we believe that? And really, we believe that if you just go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27. So we're going to go through that passage as a whole. I'm going to talk about what it means to be created in God's image. And then I'll give you some implications and some applications uh, for you as his image bearers. But let's uh, stop and we're just going to read the whole text together because it's only two verses. So just follow along with me. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. It says, Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, 
And let them have dominion over the fish of the seas and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And may God bless the reading of his word. May our hearts be open to hear from him. So if you will remember... We talked about this last week. Uh, The first five days, God is speaking to the needs of the earth in a sense. Remember, the earth was formless and void. And so he begins to step into that environment and he creates some, some boundaries. He starts giving some form before he fills it with life. And then he begins to fill it with life. And then human beings are the last thing that he brings into that environment that is both uh, protected and there is provision for human beings. And we talked about, we used that analogy last week where we talked about bringing a, a, a newborn into the home and you, you create these boundaries, these, these safety nets, and you, you provide all those things that that child is going to need to thrive inside the home as an analogy for what God is doing here in Genesis. But one of the things that I want to point out as we go, as we think about the sixth day of creation and how that is distinct from other days, uh, one of the things I want to point out is the verb that is used, uh, created. Uh, The Hebrew verb that is used, created, is only used three times uh, in this passage. It's used in verse 1, where God created the heavens and the earth. That is ex nihilo. He was the first cause. He created it out of nothing. Um, the second one is when he created the, the fish of the, or the creatures, the, the fish and the animals and all the different species there in verse 21. And the third time is in 27. The rest of the times, if you'll notice, the verb there is he made. It's a, di- it's a different Hebrew verb. And the reason why I point that out is very quickly just to make a distinction that God created animals according to their different species, and then he created humankind. Um, You are not an accident. You did not evolve from animals. Uh, You are a special creation of God, completely distinct, even in the way that the text is written to highlight that fact. And so I want to make that distinction as we go into this because you were uniquely created in a totally different, unique way. And so I want to tell you what some of those specifics are as we talk about the image of God in which you were created. So the first thing is this. You were created in the image of a triune God with a unique capacity. You were created in the image of a triune God with a unique capacity. Now, if you were just reading through this, um, everything you read as the the days go on uh, is uh, singular. In the beginning, God. And then God said. Everything is singular. And then you show up to verse 26, and now you see a plural. Look at it. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And the first question you ask is, who showed up? I thought, I thought God was there by himself, and now he's saying, let us. Who is that? Well, this, I believe, is a reference to the Trinity. Uh, the Trinity is distinctly Christian. It's a defining characteristic of Christianity. I want to take just a moment to briefly de- describe it. Uh, we believe in one God, Three persons. How does that make sense? Guys, there's a mysterious aspect to this uh, that we don't quite uh, understand. And again, we've got to be comfortable with mystery. You remember we talked about that. Um, But one God, three persons. These three persons are all equal in essence. They're all equal of value, equal of adoration and worship. But these three persons in the unified, singular Godhead, monotheistic Godhead, all have dis- their distinct persons. Uh, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. 
None, none of them are exactly alike in their personalities. Uh, the father did not die on the cross. The, the son died on the cross. So we believe in one God, three persons, completely unified in their purpose. N- never in conflict, never prideful, never jealous. They are all on the same page. They are completely one. So one God, three persons. And, and the reason why I want to describe that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come into play later in some of the things that we're talking about. But I also want you to see that the, the Trinity didn't just show up in verse 26. Okay, go back, go back to the beginning. This is why I wanted you to have your Bibles open. So in the beginning, God... Okay, that God, God the Father. But in verse 2, who shows up? Y'all opened your Bibles, right? Okay. <laughs> Let's have fun here. Let's go. Let's talk. Yeah, the Spirit. The Spirit is hovering over the waters. So the, the Spirit shows up. And then in verse 3, God says, let there be light. There, there is the Word of God. Now, where else have you ever heard the Word of God described? John chapter 1, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word is Jesus. So you have the Trinity in the first three verses of Genesis. They're they're already there. It's not like the other two walked up and like, what is going on here, you know? They're, They're already there. So the triune God is creating human beings in their image, in their likeness. Now, it's super complex when you start getting into what all of this means. Um, There are hundreds and hundreds of books written on this. Uh, I feel like I've read a ton of them just to prepare for this this message. But I want to try to give you some options and break down some of the defining characteristics of what it means for you to be created in the image of God. Some believe that that it means we have a material and an immaterial uh, aspect to us. Certainly, I can understand that. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, uh, he says, don't be afraid of the person who kills the body. Be afraid of the one who kills the spirit spirit. So there, there's definitely, and you are created with an immaterial, eternal aspect where you will go on because you have a soul. And in fact, that's another way that people sometimes uh, describe it in 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul says, uh, I pray that you would be sanctified in, in body, soul, and spirit. So some people uh, break it down, the, the image of God, into there. Uh, I think the best way that I've heard it described is uh, by our uh, senior executive pastor, Bill Egner. You should go to his Old Testament class. It's at 5 o'clock on Sunday nights here at the Fort Worth campus. Highly recommend it. He's a genius. It's wonderful teaching. But he breaks it down and he says basically this, that the, the image of God means that we have a mind to know God, an emotion or a heart to love God, and a will to obey God. That, that those three defining characteristics, and that is certainly true, even if you compare those things against other aspects of God's creation. Other aspects of God's creation don't have a mind to know him, a heart to love him, and a will to obey him. And so you are created with this unique capacity that no other aspect of creation was given because you were created in the image of God. Therefore, here's your application. Relate to your creator with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Relate to your creator with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or another way I could say that is relate to God with the full capacity that God has given you. The full capacity that God has given you. If you remember in Matthew chapter 22 when Jesus is summing up the law, he says, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That we have been given this unique capacity to know God, love God, and obey God in a way that no one else has. And he says, love God with all those things, with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think that oftentimes we have areas of strength, like I love God with my mind or uh, I love God with my heart, but we can grow 
in all of those aspects. Because honestly, if we don't uh, use our entire capacity, then we're not relating to God fully how you were created to relate to him. I, I, I compare it to this. Um, how many of you were ever in a long distance relationship? Do you, I, was, I remember being in long distance relationships back when you dialed long distance. Do you, do you remember that? You remember long distance? I know that there are some people that are like, what in the world is long distance? What are you talking about? Well, you had to use a phone that was actually connected to a wall. Okay, I know, I know it's crazy, crazy stuff here that we're talking about. But you would have to dial long distance. And I, I remember I, I had a girlfriend back, back in the time when I had to, to dial long distance, racked up a very expensive bill. Um, but I remember, I'm like, all we have is the phone. That's it. And yes, kids, there was no FaceTime back then either, okay? Couldn't, couldn't see her. Uh, couldn't be around her. Couldn't give her a hug. Nothing like that. Couldn't hold her hand. It was just her voice. It was just a, a limited capacity to our relationship. And sometimes we treat God the same way where we limit that capacity. We just have a long-distance relationship where we go, well, God, I pray. Well, well do you read his word? Like he's talking, he's talking back to you. Do you relate to his body? Like physically, do you come be a part of the body of Christ? That's what we are as a local fellowship. There are different aspects and capacity in which you were created to relate to God. Don't treat him as a long-distance relationship where you only connect with him in one way because you were created with a greater capacity that no other aspect of creation has so that you can relate to him. And then second... Uh, you were created in the image of a personal God. So you were created in the image of a triune God with a unique capacity, but you were also created in the image of a personal God with a unique dignity, with a unique dignity. Uh, if you look back at uh, some of the patterns back in uh, Genesis 1 and the patterns. And we talked a little bit about that last week of how God created. Uh, one of the things that you will notice is on those first five days, uh, God says, let there be. So it's a, it's a singular and it's an impersonal uh, aspect in a sense. You, you know what I mean by that. If you look at the sixth day when he creates humans, now you get a plural and a personal it's completely different. Look, look back at it. Uh, the first part of verse 26 and then verse 27. And God said, let us, it's personal. This is personal. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Again, completely different and distinct and separate from the animals, the fish, the creepy crawlers that he mentions uh, beforehand. Uh, this is, you did not evolve, you are not an accident. This is a completely different, unique uh, creation, and it's a personal one to God. It's a personal one. Y you are his. And when you talk about people uh, being gods, I'm going to use the, the analogy of children because that's a, the analogy that scripture uses. Um, that creates, your child has inherent worth to you. No doubt. They're, they're your child. That is your son. That is your daughter. That, that, and, and, and honestly, an aside, I mean, you all feel this way. If somebody loves your child, you love them. If, if, they, if they are for your child, man, you are for them. Well, they have a, a distinct and unique dignity simply because they're your child. It's the same way with every human being. Man, woman, child, male, female. They have inherent dignity because they are created in God's image, his personal image. He says, this is my son, this is my daughter. They bear my image. And so they have inherent uh, dignity. One of the things I want to point out, too, is that when God creates human beings, it says that he creates them male and female. 
Now, I know that you heard uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. They're actually both from God, okay? <laughs> They're both from God. But I, I, want, I want to highlight that uh, for a second because male and female both represent the image of God. They are equal in value, equal in dignity, equal as image bearers. Okay, please hear me say that. Yes, they are distinct. They are different from one another. And I believe there are two distinct genders. And I think God assigns that gender because God creates them male and female. I think, I think that's, that's clear from the scriptures. But I, I, it's analogous in some ways, uh, in a very distant way, but you'll follow me here, to this is why I spent some time talking about the Trinity, where the Trinity, all three e distinct persons, but equal in value. Same with male and female. Uh, both equal in dignity, in value, in bearing the image of God. Distinct in person. Different. But equal uh, in respect, which is our application uh, for this section. Respect every person as they bear the image of God. Respect every person as they bear the image of God. Now, I want you to notice one of the words that I used in that application is respect every person as they bear the image of God. I didn't say as they demonstrate the image of God. Because we believe, Scripture teaches, and this is why we're spending so much time on it, that life begins at conception, and that's when somebody begins to bear the image of God. It's not that they bear the image of God and they're really nice people or they're really kind, so therefore, show them respect. Every person, man, woman, child, male, female, doesn't matter doesn't matter the skin color, doesn't matter the, the language that they speak, doesn't matter their ability, inability, whatever. Human beings bear the image of God and therefore deserve respect. They deserve respect, they deserve dignity because we care for God's children. And a human being is God's child bearing his image. So let me say very quickly, uh, human beings are not made to be used or abused, or pawns for your purposes or pleasure. That's not what they are created for. So we need to re remember that. And then second, what we need to also remember is one way sometimes that we can show respect to people and give them the dignity that they're due as an image bearer of God is to show deference to them. Sometimes in our world, I feel like, especially these days, the climate of our, our culture is like this zero-sum game where I always have to win and whoever is across from me always has to lose. And that, that's, first of all, that's not true. Uh, second of all, uh, that's not the posture that God takes with people. In fact, we are called to take on the mind of Christ that in Philippians 2, we're told, consider others better than himself. You do remember, that's Jesus. And sometimes showing dignity and respect means giving deference to, to some folks. I'm not saying tolerance. I'm not saying be unbiblical. I'm not saying go into sin. But I am saying, do we consider other people better than ourselves? Because that is the mind of Christ. That's a hard thing to do, but we've got to show respect and dignity to those who are created in God's image. And then finally, the third aspect of the image of God. You were created in the image of a purposeful God with a unique responsibility. You were created in the image of a purposeful God with a unique responsibility. And I know that we've used that word purpose and we're going to continue to do that uh, because that's where we get our purposes from God's creation that we see his intention. So I know that I'm being repetitive with that word and you're like, okay, are you going to change it up? No, not going to change it up. Uh, you need to understand your purpose is God-given. It's not something you have to seek out. It's not something you have to make up. 
we find this purpose. He, he mentions it here in verse 26 after he says, let us make mankind in our image. And it says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the seas and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So he talks about dominion. You, you've been placed on this earth to have dominion. Now, we're going to go into that more next week in the verses 28 and 30 because there are more verbs that are in that passage where he blesses them. He says, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, have dominion, etc." We're going to dig down into what that means. Today, we're focusing not on the human doing. We're focusing on the human being and what that means. But as a human being, as an image bearer, you are meant to represent God on this earth. You, you are meant to be his representative. That's why you, you see this transfer of authority in a sense, which we'll talk uh, more about. But he says, I want you to represent me. You, you have a purpose to represent him in this life. And, and this is on your sermon notes. But I want to stop for a second and just uh, go through that God has a purpose for every life. God has a purpose for your life. God has the purpose of the life of the preborn uh, child. God has a purpose for uh, people that, honestly, the world doesn't give any value to. But he has a purpose for every life. And I want to just uh, lay that out uh, just very quickly. I put this on your sermon notes. But first, life is created by God. Life is created by God. Um, Psalm 139 shows us how God knits together people in their mother's wombs. And I, I highlight that fact, one, so that we go back and affirm God as the creator, but also because I want to point out, I know today can be hard for folks that are struggling with infertility. And they're struggling and they're saying, why hasn't God done this uh, for me? I, I would love, I know that he uh, creates every life and I would love to be a parent or, or whatnot. Well, we have a group, I want you to know, we have a group called Wait With Me. Uh, you can find information on the sermon notes that we want to encourage you, uh, we want to equip you, we want to support you and surround you with a some more supportive community uh, as you wait uh, for that uh, child and, and God's purpose uh, in your life. A second, uh, life is created for God. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 uh, life is created for God. Jeremiah talks about how even when he was in his mother's womb, a God was, had created him for a purpose. And I truly believe that, 100%, that every, every child, every person uh, has a purpose. Uh, third, life can be recreated for God, which is crazy, crazy cool. I mean, when you think about it, when he says, the old is gone, the new has come, you are a new creation in Christ. That when you place your trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and that he was raised from the dead on your behalf, man, that changes your life. The old is gone, the new has come. Only he can recreate a life in that way. And then finally, a life can not only be recreated for God, life can be repurposed for God can be repurposed for God. Romans 8, 28. Uh, God can work all things, all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That when we give God our life and say, God, uh, repurpose my life, he can use all things. He can use past things, uh, past regrets, wonderful successes, awful failures, all of those things. He can use our past for his purpose. He can redeem those things, which is a wonderful message. And I, and I bring that up because I know that uh, in, a, in a congregation this size, that some of you have touch points with those life issues. Uh, you, maybe there are even things that you don't want to talk about, that maybe there are things that you uh, regret. I want you to know that we are here for you. We want to encourage you. We want to support you. We actually, I, I told you this last year, we've started a group for uh, those who ha are post-abortive, like they, they've had an abortion in their past, and you want to uh, find purpose, you want to find meaning, you want to find support. We've started a group called Forgiven and Free. Uh, that You can find that information on the back of your sermon notes. Uh, you have a story to tell that God can redeem and God can use for his good, for your good. And we want to encourage you. Please hear me say this. Uh, 
there is no shame. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're not going to receive that from us. So we want to encourage you in the life that Jesus paid for, the life and life abundant. And God can repurpose those things, even if they're things that you don't particularly care to talk about. Uh, Maybe this is a time where God says, let's talk about it in, in in a safe group in a place where we can encourage, support, and repurpose that pain for his good and his glory. Which leads back to an application for all of us. Uh, Reflect the image of God as you grow in his likeness. Reflect the image of God as you grow in his likeness. And you say, Cody, I thought image and likeness were the same thing. They practically are, but let's think about it for a second. We, we know that human beings were created in God's image. And we haven't gotten into this part of Genesis, but there was a fall where we weren't living out our Christ-likeness or God-likeness the way that we should. That's why all of us, even as new creatures in Christ, new creations in him, we can continue to grow in our likeness in our Christ-likeness of him, of how he thinks, how he uh, feels, how he treats people. So you're created in his image, and therefore you can continue to grow in his likeness. Uh, Our our boys like to go back and they like to look at pictures of, you know, when they were babies and when they were toddlers and all those things. And uh, there were some photos out uh, the other day, and our younger one, uh, Hayes, was looking through them, and he, and he pulled one out, and it was a, a little baby picture and he, uh, in, a, in a carrier and whatnot, and he goes, Dad, uh, is this me? And I said, I don't know, <laughs> um, especially because we passed down all the same clothes and all that kind of stuff, and I'm just a terrible dad. I, I, it was, he was so young in there, I'm like, I don't know if that's you or Dax, but here's what I do know. As they got older and matured, um, you can definitely tell the difference. You can definitely tell not only the difference by the way that they look, but you can tell the difference by their mannerisms, their actions, their attitudes, all of those things. You can tell they belong, all the good qualities that they have belong to Jen, okay? (laughs) All the bad are on me. But as they mature, they grow in our likeness. Same way in Christ. As you mature, are you looking more like Jesus every day? Do you have his mannerisms, his attitudes, his actions? Maybe you don't see that a whole lot if you're new in Christ. But as we continue to grow, as we continue to mature in our relationship with him, the more and more we should look like the person he created us to be. Because he wants you to be uniquely you, but that also means that you're uniquely his. Let me pray for us. God... Thank you for your word that really allows us to plant our feet firmly on who you created us to be and what you've called us to, what you've set us apart for. And so I I thank you for that, that we can bet our lives on it, that we can treat other people the way that you've treated other people with your intentions, with your purpose. And so, Lord God, may our hearts be open uh, to you. Would you guide us, Lord God, to have the mind of Christ and to show the heart of Christ to those around us who are fellow image bearers. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in humble adoration, let's respond in worship. Uh, As those of us who are in created in God's image. He is the purpose giver, and we are to submit our mind and our hearts to that purpose in worship. Let's stand, and we'll sing together, I Surrender All. i
I surrender all together. Sing it. I surrender. Would we live our lives surrendered to the one who designed us, our creator, the image bearer who gave us his image to carry and to reflect to the world around us? Church, we love you. If there's next steps, we can help you walk through. If there's questions you have about our church or how to get more involved, theological questions or just ways that you say, man, I, I want to walk out some areas of obedience. I'm not sure what that looks like. Come and talk to us. There'll be pastors right outside these doors. We'd love to help you take those next steps. And always, if you'd like prayer, we'll be down front. We'd love to pray for you. And if you don't have lunch plans, join us in the Oak Room. We'd love to have you for that Sanctity of Human Life luncheon. God bless you. Have a great week. We're glad you were a part today. We normally do this at the beginning, but as we go, will you take a second to pray with me as we head into the rest of today and this next week? Father, thank you for Jesus and thank you for the life that he offers to each of us. God, I pray that these moments that we've shared and this beautiful gospel that we carry into the rest of today and into this next week, Lord, would impact not only our lives, but the lives of those around us. Lord, thank you for your incredible work in and through us. And Lord, I pray that we stay connected to you and your spirit throughout this next week until we're back together. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.